with a range of almost 8,000 miles. A bomber quite capable of flying across the North Pole and of reaching America. The turboprop engine that gave the bear its speed and range was developed by the Kuznetsov Bureau. Kuznetsov were helped by engineers who had worked with the Junkers company, recruited from Germany at the end of the war. Between 1950 and 1954, they developed a turbo shaft engine that could produce over 12,000 horsepower and drive a pair of counter-rotating propellers. The propellers themselves were supersonic with automatic pitch change. The combination of engine and propeller was extremely efficient and justified Tupolev's decision to seek long range and high speed through turboprop rather than pure jet power. The bear could fly 100 miles an hour faster than anyone thought possible in a propeller-driven aircraft. It could reach 575 miles an hour. In October 1956, there was a wave of protest across Europe at the severity of Soviet action in crushing Hungary's anti-Soviet revolt. In West Berlin, there was a torch-lit mass meeting. In Paris, the headquarters of the Communist Party was put to the torch. In Holland, the Communist Party's building was stoned. There was a fear in the West that the Soviets were reverting to tactics like those employed by Stalin to keep the Soviet Union together. In March 1958, Nikita Khrushchev, who had been first secretary of the Communist Party since the death of Stalin, and the strong man of Soviet politics, consolidated his power even further in the eyes of the West. He was elected premier, replacing Nikolai Bulganin and becoming the first Soviet leader since Stalin to be premier and party secretary. As he accepted the office, he said, we shall conquer capitalism with a high level of work and a higher standard of living. In service in the late 50s was a unique achievement for the Tupolev Design Bureau. It was the only turboprop-driven strategic bomber ever to enter first-line service in the world. And it forced change in American defensive thinking. Its potential as a strategic bomber and its potential to reach U.S. soil via the North Pole forced the U.S. to divert money and technology into the construction of interceptor fighter bases and early warning radar sites. The basic model bear was a long-range strategic bomber. It was not as big as the B-52, but was still an enormous aircraft. Its wingspan was nearly 170 feet. Its maximum takeoff weight was 415,000 pounds. It could carry 20,000 pounds of nuclear or free fall conventional weapons. The bear was a direct descendant of the Tupolev Tu-4 bull which means that it was also closely related to the American B-29 from which the bull was copied. But superficially, at least, the similarity is not obvious. The bear is a very exotic-looking aircraft. The appearance of the bear is dominated by its propellers. They are enormous, 16 and a half feet in diameter, four blades on each propeller, four engines, two propellers driven by each engine, revolving in opposite directions, a total of 32 blades. To propel the bear at its maximum speed, they are revolving at 750 revolutions a minute. The speed of the propellers at the tips is Mach 1.08, just over the speed of sound. The Kuznetsov turboprop engines produce almost 15,000 horsepower each, 
They are housed in long, narrow nacelles fared into the swept wings. the Bear A carried its bomb load internally, but the Bear B, introduced into service in the early 60s, could also carry a single large kangaroo air-to-surface missile underneath the fuselage. The kangaroo missile was roughly the size and shape of a MiG-17. It had a range of 400 miles and could travel at twice the speed of sound. The landing gear of the bear had to be extremely long to give the propellers ground clearance. And as in all Soviet military aircraft, it had to be rugged to allow landing on rough, unmade strips. The combination of 32 propeller blades and four extremely powerful turboprop engines made the Bear one of the loudest aircraft in the history of aviation. Its noise echoed round Soviet airfields for miles. There are even stories of American fighter pilots experiencing discomfort because of engine noise from Bears under escort penetrating their cockpits. Discovery Channel. In 1963, Bear Bs flying over the American fleet near the Azores and off Midway Island were intercepted by American fighters. They were different from the Bear A in that they had long in-flight refueling probes in the nose and the recesses that were normally occupied by the kangaroo missile were fared over and fitted with camera ports for photographic surveillance. There was also a large blister on the starboard side of the fuselage. The Bears were particularly interested in the U.S. carrier's forestal and constellation. And a great deal of film was exposed by both the Soviets and the Americans as the cat-and-mouse game between fighter and reconnaissance aircraft was played out. was identified by NATO in 1967. Uh, these American F-4 Phantoms are shadowing one to take pictures. The Bear D had a large blister fairing under the center of the fuselage. It housed surface search radar. Opportunities to photograph Soviet aircraft in detail were accepted whenever possible by NATO aircraft so that the latest information on development could be analyzed and fed into the identification system. A Soviet manned bomber fleet capable of striking freely around the world had been Stalin's dream. A response to the development of the great American bombers of the late 40s and 50s. And Khrushchev's attitude was different. He decided that increasing reliance would be placed on long-range surface-to-surface missiles for the delivery of Soviet nuclear weapons. By the mid-50s, the intercontinental ballistic missile seemed more promising to Khrushchev than the manned bomber. His opinion was shared by other high-ranking military personnel. In 1955, the commander-in-chief of the Soviet Air Force predicted the demise of the manned bomber. He said they were expensive to build, man, and maintain. They had to be housed in large airfields where they were vulnerable to air attack. They tied up large numbers of maintenance personnel and needed great supplies of fuel. Missiles, on the other hand, were cheaper to build, less costly to maintain, easily concealable, and less vulnerable. That view was reinforced in the early 60s. A publication on Soviet military strategy 
said that the defeat of the enemy's strategic weapons and land forces would largely be achieved by nuclear missile strikes. In the early 60s, some Soviet military academies stopped training bomber crews and instead concentrated on preparing officers for the strategic rocket force. Long-range bomber personnel began to worry about their careers. But even though under Khrushchev the role of the long-range bomber force was downgraded, it was still in a condition to be revived. Soviet missile development did not proceed as quickly and effectively as Khrushchev wished. Production of the Bear and the Badger continued into the 60s. Bombers were capable of carrying air-launched guided missiles that allowed them to stand off from the target rather than have to penetrate deep into enemy airspace. By the late 60s, a resurgence in belief in the long-range bomber was beginning. While it was accepted that the bear, the badger, and the bison would never penetrate American airspace, they could still easily reach most parts of Europe. With their range supplemented by an efficient system of aerial refueling and their ability to use either standoff weapons or freefall bombs, they were still a major threat to the West. Even when the supersonic backfire and later the blackjack entered service, there was still a place for the bear. In 1984, 30 years after the prototype Tu-95 flew, a new variant identified by NATO as Bear H entered service. It could carry a long-range cruise missile and was capable of hitting targets inside the USA without ever entering American airspace. At the time, the Bear H which appeared with much less fanfare than the supersonic blackjack, was seen as a major threat to Europe and America. The cruise missile it carried, the AS-15, was considered a serious challenge to the American air defense system. After almost 40 years of service, the great rumble of the Bears' engines can still be heard across Russia Europe and the oceans of the world. These days, they are even becoming welcome guests at some of the world's great air shows, giving Western audiences a close-up look at one of the most extraordinary aircraft ever built. Coming up, break through the brush and go on the hunt. From chilly Alaska to a sweltering Africa, watch out. High action and adventure continues on Wild Discovery. Coming up only on the Discovery.